Hey guys, I'm Ted. Uh, welcome back to our lecture series and we are here to wrap up our uh, quick view at the United States and the Confederate States on the eve of the opening of hostility to um, open warfare between the two um, in 1861. Now, uh, to such basis on what we uh, last uh, talked about, we were talking about the advantages and disadvantages of both sides. Um, geography, of course, played a very big role for the Confederacy with their major advantage. Uh, that along with their war games, uh, their, their war goals. They, they didn't need to uh, do much to win the war. If the United States did nothing, they won by default. Um, if, they, if the United States became exhausted, if the United States were tired, was uh, tired out, um, they won as well. All they had to do was sit back and merely respond initially to the United States. Uh, and of course, the United States enjoyed an overwhelming industrial advantage, but the Confederate States en enjoyed uh, an equally uh, disproportionate agrarian advantage because uh, um, cotton cultivation gave the United States a favorable balance of trade alone. Even though cotton prices have been falling for so long, have been, have been falling in recent years, cotton alone gave the United States a favorable balance of trade that coupled with tobacco indigo rice sugar uh, it, it gave them uh, it gave them a, a nice uh, boost it gave them uh, once they were uh, once they were able to uh, find markets for the goods get the goods to market it gave them the ability to acquire the things that they did not have to continue the war clothing rifles ordinances, uh, so, so the Confederates uh, not so disadvantaged, um, and then of course the institution of slavery allowed the Confederates to mobilize 80 percent of their uh, adult male age um, male age citizens. The United States was able to put about a uh, uh, what was it? I think um, I think the United States was able to put about one. Uh, 2.1 million men into uh, into un into service. Um, so yeah. So and again, that that, that uh, 2.1 I think was 50 percent of of their military age male population. Um, so still uh, advantages, but not damning or crippling advantages for both sides. Uh, and from there, we're gonna pick up with um, perhaps the most um, the most often talked about topic, uh, one of the most often talk, talked about topics of the United States Civil War, and that would be commanders. That that would be able commanders. Now there is a consistent narrative when, with with uh, regards to the United States Civil War that the Confederate States had far better military leaders and that they simply ran out of manpower, they simply ran out of juice to fully prosecute the war. Now the Confederate States did not have superior military commanders. Uh, most observers of the United States Civil War tend to view that uh, because they only view the campaigns that took place in Virginia, uh, what's called the Eastern Theater. They only tend to view that. Um, and when you do that, it, well, when you only take into um, take into account the campaigns that took place in Virginia, Maryland, and Pennsylvania, um, has had been significant at being the only noteworthy campaigns of the United States Civil War. It's easy, it's easy to uh, to draw that 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 comparison when you look at Robert E. Lee, James Longstreet, Thomas Jackson, uh, Jeb Stewart. When when you look at these men on one hand and you compare them with George McClellan. John Pope, Ambrose Burnside, and Fighting Joe Hooker. Uh, when, when you when you compare those men, it's easy to come to that conclusion um, that the Confederate States had far better military leadership. But if you shift your focus to the Western Theater across the Appalachian Mountains, um, east of the Mississippi River, but west of the Appalachian Mountains to uh, Kentucky, Tennessee, Mississippi, Louisiana. Um, when when you when you look at uh, the theater there, you draw a completely different conclusion. Uh, the United States commanders in, in this theater were Ulysses S. Grant, uh, William Tecumseh Sherman, John Schofield, uh, Schofield, and Philip Sheridan. These men were commanding in the uh, the United States armies in the West. 
uh, and they were up against uh, Confederate officers such as uh, Braxton Bragg, um, John Bell Hood, Pierre Beauregard, um, and Polk, uh, Leonidas Polk. Uh, they were up against these men who were far below their, their, their caliber, their quality. Um, when, when you look at this, when, 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 you, when you look at the Western theater, it's easy to draw the conclusion that the United States had the better military commanders. Um, but the reality is that there were approximate equal number of talented officers and untalented officers on both sides. Now, the United States held an advantage in the number of West Point graduates. And now West Point graduates had always played a prominent role uh, from its founding in the United States military history. Um, a number of, uh, uh, and, it, and it continues to do so to this day. West Point graduates, um, it is said, are, are more likely to attain the rank of uh, flag star, uh, flag officers, I'm sorry, flag officers or general officers. You're more likely to uh, attain that rank if you're a West Pointer. Um, even now in the United States military, in the United States Army, I should say. But but uh, but they did hold a majority of West Pointers who uh, fought in the war. Uh, most of the field army, corps, and division commanders for both armies were trained at West Point. Over 700 West Point graduates served in the United States Army, while over 280 entered Confederate service. Um... There were some factors that offset uh, this number and gave the Confederate Army, uh, particularly, particularly the Confederate Army of Northern Virginia, an edge in overall leadership against all other military units that they faced. Now, one, the United States Army fielded more troops and thus they needed a larger Army uh, officer corps. It wasn't as though they had all these officers in small select units. These officers were spread uh, uh, across, spread out across the, the entire army, the entire military force that the United States put into field to fight the Confederate States. Uh, two, the professional officers of the regular United States Army were kept together and they were kept in the far western territories. Uh, they were not brought across the, the, across the Mississippi River to lead the flood of incoming volunteers. This was a major setback to the United States war effort and was eventually uh, reconciled later in the war after the initial fighting went badly. Third, military academies in the South sent hundreds of officers into the service of the Confederate States. Uh, two chief examples of this would be the Virginia Military Institute and the, and the Military College of South Carolina. Um, and the other Confederate states had military schools, had state military schools that provided trained military leaders to the Confederate Army. Uh, four, the Confederate states had highly trained citizen patrols that drilled regularly and were under trained officers. And these, uh, these patrols were, were always on guard, always um, on, uh, on notice to uh, assemble and put down potential slave uprisings and to generally monitor these free and enslaved African-American populations. They frequently patrolled free African-American communities. Um, they, this was a, a sort of um, a social necessity in order to maintain, in order to con uh, corral uh, the slaves to one uh, do as they were told to, in order to force the slaves to labor and then also to keep the free blacks from conspiring with slaves or without slaves to um, spark uprisings. So, so, so they had this uh, this large pool already of trained and disciplined men who were well accustomed to military maneuvers and and, uh, and um, uh, military uh, tactics and training. They already had this large pool of military of knowledgeable military personnel to draw on. Uh, and five, um, the Virginia Military Institute alone sent over 1,000 men uh, into the, uh, well, they, they sent over 70,000 men into the Confederate Army, but over 1,000 men into the Confederate Army of Northern Virginia. That would be the, uh, the principal army of, of the Eastern Theater, the army commanded by Robert E. Lee. Uh, 
the Virginia Military Institute sent an overwhelming number of trained, knowledgeable personnel into this uh, into this uh, force. Um, this provided a significant boost to the structure and performance of these armies, uh, particularly the Army of Northern Virginia, which would attain spectacular success because of this uh, because of this uh, advantage. Now. Also, uh, within regards to the Confederate States and the United States, leader, uh, aside from military commanders, political leaders, namely their presidents, Abraham Lincoln, uh, 16th President of the United States, and uh, Jefferson Davis, the sole president of the Confederate States of, the, of America. Um, and to begin with, uh, let, 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 let's look at Lincoln in this comparison. Both men are compared frequently with Lincoln always coming out on top of Davis. And rightfully so, when you when you examine uh, his starting position, uh, Lincoln was originally seen as the less knowledgeable and capable of the two uh, in terms of political know-how and also of military matters. Lincoln had only briefly served as a company-grade officer during the Black Hawk War in Illinois, and most of his time was spent um, not seeing any meaningful combat at all. Uh, he had only briefly served as a congressional representative from Illinois for one term in the 1840s. Uh, Lincoln, however, was a very shrewd man, and he quickly learned on the job. Um, Lincoln studied military tactics. Uh, he heeded the advice of his generals and top military aides, and he came to understand what the United States needed to do to win the war. He came to understand that the United States needed to apply pressure across the board against the Confederate States uh, so that the Confederate States could not match the United States evenly. He came to understand that it was necessary to target the belligerent armies uh, and not cities or other geographic designations. Early on, he realized that it was of the utmost importance to confront and to continually confront and hopefully defeat the Army of Northern Virginia uh, before advancing to the city of Richmond. This was driven home quite painfully after uh, First Manassas. Uh, it, it became quite clear painfully to Lincoln and to the rest of the United States that defeating Robert E. Lee and that defeating the Army of Northern Virginia would need to be done before Richmond could be taken. Uh, Lincoln's greatest strength, though, when, uh, when evaluating him as a leader, had to be his ability to reach compromises with his political adversaries and his generals. He was willing to change his war aims and approach from simply doing whatever was necessary, uh, making any sort of political guarantee that would be necessary to bring the states back into the Union, to fully authorizing and fully supporting attacking Confederate uh the infrastructure in the Confederate States, seizing slaves to contraband the war, freeing slaves to demoralize uh, Confederates, and also destroying crops and infrastructure, um, vital infrastructure in the Confederate States to bring them to heel. He matured into a very good war leader uh, and really showed his talent as a politician. Now, Jefferson Davis, on the other hand, was a good leader for the Confederate States. Um, he had political and military experience. He was a West Point graduate. He has served with distinction in the Mexican War. And he has served as Franklin Pierce's Secretary of War. And he was a very effective Secretary of War. He did a very sound job as President of the Confederate States. He initially tried to do too much um, in the early uh, military defense of the Confederate States. He, he, um, he pushed and stressed that, that uh, more should be done. Uh, he came to support the offensive defensive strategy that, uh, that is the, the best defense of the very strong offense um, advocated by Robert E. Lee. He, when, when evaluating Jefferson Davis, uh, among other things, his biggest fault was his unwillingness to give his generals leeway. Uh, overall, he was a competent man in terms of military know-how, but he suffers uh, 
and he suffers greatly in comparison with Lincoln because of his political um, abilities as a leader. He made enemies frequently. Um, he was a very powerful slave -crat. Him and his brother owned plantations and hundreds of slaves in the area known as the Bend in Mississippi. He was a very prominent sugar uh, plantation master. Uh, but, but he suffers because of his political miscues, his political Ill inabilities, the fact that he was on the losing side of the war, and also he suffers uh, because of his personal convictions. Um, it's very easy to look at Lincoln and say, well, Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation, and didn't free any slaves, but he, but he threatened to free slaves, um, so, so we like Lincoln. And it's very easy to look at Jeff Davis and say, well, Jeff Davis was a, was a vicious, cruel slave owner, he was a sugar planter slave owner, and those were some of the worst uh, slave owners. Um, so it was easy to say to paint Jeff Davis into a corner. Um, not as competent as Lincoln politically, um, and he was outclassed by Lincoln militarily uh, in the war. He also was really, uh, really just wasn't able to to recompromise this with anyone uh, of his subordinates or political opponents. Uh, and lastly, when evaluating the United States and the, and the Confederate States uh, before hostilities broke out, we must look at foreign intervention. Um, France and the United Kingdoms, from the beginning of the secession movement, were targeted by both powers. Uh, it, was, it was an early area of diplomatic concern uh, that the two powers of, the, that, of, of what would what would the two great powers of Europe do became great concern, not just in the United States, not just in their respective uh, kingdom and empire, because at this point in 1860, uh, Napoleon III, the nephew of Napoleon I and the cousin of Napoleon II, had orchestrated a, a, a what, what can only be described as a bourbon renaissance, a rebirth of, not bourbon, Bonaparte, a Bonaparte renaissance, sorry about that, in France, he had uh, come to power upon the disposition of Louis Philippe, the quote-unquote citizen king, um, the last Bourbon to rule France, Bourbon king. Uh, he he uh, he orchestrated the uh, the return as president first. He was president uh, Louis Charles uh, Napoleon Bonaparte. Uh, very quickly, um, he orchestrated a political coup in which he overthrew the French Republic and instituted instead the Second French Empire with him as emperor in 1852. And between 1852 and 1870, he ruled as emperor of France. And he was a very successful French emperor, a very ambitious man, a very shrewd man, a very capable man. Um, did a lot to uh, improve the quality of life in France, um, helped put an end to slavery in the French colonies, and did a lot to uh, modernize France and to sort of bridge the gap between France and the United Kingdom. Uh, at this point, he was even, uh, uh, during the United States Civil War, he was making major overtures uh, towards Mexico. He would eventually, um, he would eventually uh, spearhead the movement to collapse the Mexican Republic and revive a, a, a monarchical empire, a European style monarchical empire in Mexico and he will place uh, one uh, the younger brother, um, Archduke Maximilian of Austria-Hungary, the younger brother of Franz Josef, the Emperor of Austria-Hungary on the throne of Mexico. So he was making major political moves in the New World. The British of course held a uh, the majority of the uh, the Caribbean islands had colonial possessions, and they held Canada. Um, what the two powers would do was of the utmost concern. It was uh, it was make or break. For example, if the British Royal Navy decided to challenge uh, or break the United States blockade on the Confederate States, it would be it would have been an enormous obstacle for the United States Navy to overcome. Uh, if the French uh, had decided to rally with Mexico, had decided to uh, send troops in to support the Confederate States and march out uh, from Mexico or even uh, to attack um, to attack California or to simply march out uh, 
from uh, or simply sail across the Atlantic and attack the Atlantic seaboard, it would have been disastrous for the United States. Everyone was very cognizant to the fact that Bourbon France, vis-a-vis uh, -vis Louis the Sixteenth and his ministers, uh, their aid had been so instrumental to the revolution of 1776. French intervention was vital in 1776. If France decided to aid the Confederate States, it would simply be 1776 all over. It, it, was, it would be too much for the United States to bear. The United States was uh, better compared to the Confederate States in terms of industrial capacity, but not better than France or Great Britain. Definitely not. Definitely not coming close to Great Britain in 1860 in terms of industrial output capacity or naval strength or really even army strength uh, if Napoleon the third had really wanted to the French army would have made crucial difference uh, the, the crucial difference uh, in, uh, in in regards to the to the uh, to the war effort but at this side but but at this time in, in uh, 1861 neither side neither France or the United Kingdom had made any sort of decision. Uh, it was said that from the that from the beginning, Napoleon III wanted to recognize the Confederacy, wanted to recognize them, wanted to aid them, wanted to do all that stuff. But he but he was slow to do so because of the British, and the British would have been unwilling to challenge the United States blockade because even though the United States blockade was was really incomplete, the British blockaded people all the time to prove a point. Uh, and they always insisted that a partial blockade, you didn't need to, block, to blockade all the points. But if you partially blockaded a nation's ports, it in effect made the, uh, made the entire nation blockaded and that other nations had to respect it. It was a position they held consistently throughout the 19th century. And it would be one they were, they were, that they were unwilling to challenge for the sake of the Confederacy, they did, they did not want to concede the point uh, for future arguments. For future arguments, um, uh, so now, uh, in summary of our of our look at both the United States and the Confederate States, the United States held considerable advantages, but not so great had to make the Confederate States or their drive for independence futile. The war would really come down to which side could marshal their resources better and gain enough ground to convince the other side's population to concede that the war simply wasn't worth it. Now, with that being said, we'll end, uh, we'll end our, our look at both sides in our, in, our, in our next lecture. We will dive straight into the war. We will look at the, the first campaign, the opening campaigns, of the United States Civil War. As always, I am Ted. Uh, hit like, subscribe, and comment. Let me know what you thought about this lecture. And I'll see you guys next time. Uh, happy to begin our discussion on the United States Civil War.